Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Wee. Today marks the beginning of a 12th season for me doing this shtick, and I couldn't be happier. Thank you for having me back. It is the best vacation to get away from San Diego and come up here and do this and hang out with you guys for a week. It's, please, find another reason to keep me here. Okay, anyone here, uh, not here, been here before? Any newbies? Guests? Yay, lots of nice, thank you for coming, you brave people, and thank you for your friends who invited you or bribed you to uh, show up. This is not a lecture, I'm just gonna speak briefly half an hour about the program you're about to enjoy by the Santa Barbara Symphony. And the best part is that you get to interrupt me and ask questions. Don't just throw a shoe because whatever. Um, yeah, the, the important part is to get an answer to your question. So ask a question about the music or the program or the general culture. And that's the point of doing all this to enhance your enjoyment of the concert not necessarily to make you musicologists or musicians. Any questions so far? Okay, and the name is pronounced Ramon. Okay, okay. Yay, it's a one composer concert, Mozart. How many of you get your sense of the personality of Mr. Mozart from the movie Amadeus? You are dismissed. Amadeus is a wonderful fantasy movie by Milos Forman, a wonderful work of art in its own right, but it is not by any means a documentary. The two pieces you're going to hear on the program today come from the last years of Mozart's life, specifically the last three years, and they are enucleated somewhat in that wonderful movie, but with many traditional distortions. I am here to clean those up for you, so you can win bets at the, at the water cooler later about actual scholarship. The first piece is the last categorized symphony, or cataloged, not categorized, cataloged symphony of Mozart, the 41st symphony, the so-called Jupiter symphony in the key of C. The boy wrote more than 60 symphonies, but only 41 are officially cataloged as mature symphonies in, with that given name. Uh, that's a long musicological uh, edit there because of the nature of the word symphony and symphonia and the function is in his early life. Speaking of his early life, I'm going to give you a précis, an overview of his life. When he was a boy, he was an all-star touring virtuoso with his dad and his sister, Nannerl. Mozart, in those days, you didn't go and give public concerts you went and gave private concerts and recitals at the homes of the people who paid you to provide the fancy classical music that we now enjoy publicly with a purchased ticket. In those days, you had to be invited or part of the family or subscribing to a group, when you, which meant, meant that you're wealthy, in order to even encounter Mozart. Mozart and his, and his entrepreneurial father went from castle to court to palace to church to wherever the fancy folks were. The nobility or the, the royalty, the aristocracy, and the ecclesiastic class. Those or classes. Those were the benefactors, the patrons of classical music in Europe in the 18th century. So the boy grew up in the lap of luxury somewhat. Interestingly, of course, as we well know, very wealthy people can be very stingy. The boy did not necessarily get paid well or even remunerated. Sometimes they gave him trinkets. And his father, maybe a little money, a little, a little padding here and there, but gifts such as snuff boxes, um, jewelry, chocolate, which was a rarity or a, a new thing in, in Europe at the time, and uh, sometimes money, gold, precious gifts, etc. Clothing was a way of paying him. He was a little performing monkey. Famously, 
they would put a blindfold on the boy, put him in front of a harpsichord, and have him improvise, and he could. He, they would give him a piece of music, and he could improvise on that piece of music in various voices. He could play polyphonic music on the harpsichord or the early piano. He could sing. He played violin while his sister played the keyboard. He was unbelievably deeply talented. His father took him on tour for that reason. That's the famous part of his life. As he approached adolescence, he came back to Salzburg, his city of nativity, or natal state, if you will, and he became a church musician in his dad's orchestra, playing violin and writing tons and tons of music. Remember, the boy was writing since he was seven. Before he could actually hold a pen, he dictated music to his father, who wrote it down for him. By the time he was 17, he had become a virtuoso violinist, as well as a concert pianist. And he wrote concertos to play at the piano. He wrote 27 of those. He wrote five immortal violin concertos that he himself performed, plus tens of serenades, I think it was a dozen, or two dozen serenades, and of course, the 60 symphonies. Unbelievable amounts of church music, 17 masses, string quartets, string trios, piano sonatas, piano quartets, occasional band music, music for winds alone, flute concertos, oboe concertos, at the end of his life, a clarinet concerto. He was a musical tree that gave fruit in every season. Amazing talent. That's why you make movies about him and not about his contemporary Florian Gassmann. Remember Florian Gassmann? <laughs> Has anyone here ever encountered the name of this fabulous musician, Florian Gassmann? Relatives of the Gassmanns are <laughs> back there. <laughs> we remember him well. Well, Mozart was a prodigy beyond, to this day, beyond belief. Uh, his personality was well depicted in Milos Forman's movie. He was a very happy boy and tended to be a joker, and he was quite happy-to-go-lucky. He was also very vain. He knew he was a genius. He knew before his dad knew that he had much more talent than the world would ever get to hear, unfortunately. And it took other people like Haydn, who met him in his middle age, when the boy was, what, 20 or so, and he told in a beautiful, beautiful story, uh, listening to Mozart playing second violin in a string quartet at a private concert, he leaned over to Leopold Mozart, the father of the boy, and said, my hand to God, and as an honest German, your son, and by the way, this is the most famous and important composer in Europe speaking, Franz Joseph Haydn, your son, knows more about the composition of music than anyone in the world, including me. He was 20 years old. Just to give you an idea, when a talent of that stature can recognize that you're dealing with serious, serious stuff here. Well, anyways, Mozart made his living as a church musician for a while, an orchest orchestral musician. He wrote lots of church music. This is the part of his oeuvre that you probably will not get in this lifetime to hear all of. It is uh, remarkable how much music he wrote for the church, and he was rather proud of it. It takes talent and training to learn how to write in the uh, appropriate style for the appropriate gig. That's why you have Composers who are church musicians predominantly, and others who are secular virtuosos, and others who are chamber musicians, and Mozart could do all of it with ease. So he writes tons and tons of music. In the last 10 years of his life, once he got away from Salzburg, he's now in his, um, he's about 25 years old. He died, by the way, at the age of 35 and a half. Okay, with that kind of achievement, you can understand why the great Tom Lehrer, the comedian and pianist, said, it is of no consolation to know that when Mozart was my age, he'd been dead for four years. <laughs> Anyways, so now we're in Vienna, the, the, the imperial city of the Habsburg Empire. Mozart cannot land the one thing 
He could do everything but hold a job. He, his perky, crazy personality sometimes burned bridges before he crossed them. And he um, was always dissatisfied with his employment because he understood how, what he could do, but no one could recognize it. Uh, certainly not the people in power who were in positions to pay him. And so it was a struggle. Well, in the last part of his life, the last five years or so, things were going up and down, but ultimately they were beginning to settle somewhat. His fame was everywhere. Not, he, had, they had, they had out, he had remarkably outgrown the boy virtuoso fame and was now respected by mature musicians as a force to contend with. And he was being commissioned to write operas for like the city of Prague, that's where he wrote Don Giovanni, etc. And this is in, in his late life. Opera being the regnant form at, in music, classical music at the time in Europe, everyone wanted to write opera. So this guy could write chamber music, private music, public music, military music, church music, and of course he wrote opera. And towards the end of his life, we don't know why he wrote the last three symphonies. Being an extremely practical musician, he would have to have occasion to write a symphony. Typically, the symphony was a filler, a piece that you put on a program and you didn't necessarily play it sequentially. You would play one movement and then the juggler would come out or the singer, as you do a couple of songs, and then the clarinet quintet would come out and then another movement of the symphony or a chorus. It was uh, concerts in those times were more like um, talent shows almost. So the symphony was not taken seriously. And this was developed, the symphony was developed in the hands of the Germans beginning with Haydn and Mozart where it took on a stature of importance and gravity that would be inherited by the great Beethoven in the next generation and taken to unbelievable, unpredictable uh, um, lengths, not only in its length, a, a symphony in the hands of Haydn earlier was like 16 minutes long. Beethoven's last symphony is 90 minutes because it has something to say. Mozart, also helped in the development of the symphony that we take for granted. A symphony is now an important part of the symphonic uh, uh, repertoire. You go to the Santa Barbara Symphony to hear them play the symphonies of Brahms, Rachmaninoff, Sibelius, Tchaikovsky, Mahler, Mozart, Beethoven, because these are important instrumental pieces of music. In Mozart's early life, Opera and vocal music dominated the scene. That's why the symphonies were not considered as important. The last three symphonies that he wrote, 39, 40, and 41, had no occasion. And yet the quality of these three, actually the last five symphonies that he wrote, we know that they had occasions for the other, uh, the other two, the quality of these symphonies are strangely profound. They are, and that's why the Romantic era took these and said, these have meaning, these have content, these have personality, they have autobiographical sense even. If you listen carefully to the slow movement of the Jupiter Symphony, you hear an expressiveness that was only really outlined in operatic arias. It sounds like singers without words, emoting as they would on an operatic stage about their loss, etc. You hear that instrumentally. That's one of the glories of Western classical music, is how it, em the emergence of instrumental art that finally came to be on par with vocal art. Remember, the, the absolute basis, the egg, of Western classical music is Gregorian chant, church music, vocal art, a cappella. That was the flame that began the fire that became the, you know, the conflagration of the great, uh, great Austro-Hungarian um, symphonic world. It began with vocal music. Vocal quality is what you want. Anyways, any questions so far? The 
question is, in 21st century terms, had he, had Mozart not been, uh, quote, self-destructive and stressed out, would he have survived? Yes, he would, uh, we, one would hope. He had against him, not helping him, the medical practices of the 18th century. More on that at the, at the, at the very end. Remind me to, to mention that, what actually killed him. His mother died when they were on tour together, he and his mother, when he was 22 years old. She died in Paris, and famously, he did not tell his father because he was so ashamed. He brought his mother, they had to watch over him, and his exhausted, the trip exhausted his mother. She died in Paris, and he sent letters home to dad saying, everything's fine, everything's fine. And then when the truth came out later, come home now. Yeah, that's another story. There's lots, I mean, we could talk about Mozart for years. He's an industry. Whom did he study with? Very good question. His father was his foremost teacher, technically. The boy, however, the aspect of his talent was that he never needed a mentor. He was, as they say in the movies, the kid's a natural. He was absorptive. He studied with everybody by reading scores particularly when they came, remember in those days, they considered the music of 20 years prior to be antique. So you'd have to go find an expert or a collector to find music of, of Bach or Handel. And when he encountered that, he learned a lot about counterpoint. Basically, his tuition was that of other working musicians. He learned about the clarinet by hanging out with the Stadler brothers. He learned about the horn by hanging out with Leutgeb or Leutgeb. These are instrumentalists in the Vienna area and also at home in Salzburg. He was an, essentially an autodidact. He taught himself primarily. The technical stuff and matters of taste came from his father. Some technical stuff in playing the violin and notation. Good question, great question. That's a great question. All right, well, anyways, the symphony itself, four, it's four movements long. It's famous for its last movement because of the contrapuntal complexity of it. It's a very joyous, upbeat, and happy piece. It's basically the kind of music you tend to associate with a symphony in those days. Very few symphonies are dark, heavy, or, um, uh, or in any way depressive, or spiritual even. Uh, most symphonies, again, were, were considered like divertimenti. You put them in a program to make space between more important music. The, one of the achievements of Haydn and Mozart and ultimately Beethoven was to take, again, this instrumental form and raise it to make it on par with the expressivity of opera and other vocal music. That you'll hear that particularly, again, in the slow movement of the symphony, and you'll hear the sheer joy of making an orchestra exercise, and it is difficult to play, in the last movement of the Jupiter Symphony. Okay? He's essentially showing off. Okay, forward ho, let's talk about the, the Requiem. Oh, one question? Why is it called a Jupiter? In the 60 or so symphonies that, that Mozart wrote, symphonies with that title, at least half of them are in the key of C. So when you say, oh yeah, that Mozart symphony in C, which one? They weren't catalog cataloged until after his death. An empresario in London, England, when he received the score a few years after, it was, after the death of Mozart, he had it uh, on stage, or sorry, to be performed, and he, gave it the nickname, the Jupiter Symphony, worthy of Jove, worthy of the god Jupiter because of its grandiosity. It's a very, again, very upbeat piece, very godly is how the English, and it was a, it was a selling point. It's a nickname. Okay, okay, one more. Um, Yes, there were definitely, the question is, was there an overlap between Mozart and Beethoven? Yes. Whether or not, I think they did meet once and it was not necessarily a happy thing, but definitely the young Beethoven, when he arrived in Vienna from his uh, outback town of Bonn, 
he studied and heard Mozart's music. Mozart's music towards the end of his life was everywhere. It could be heard everywhere. Because his music was so good, people wanted to play it as hard as it was. One of the weird things about Mozart's music and about Beethoven's is that the working musicians in, that, in his milieu, they complained about how difficult it was. It could, because it's got more stuff to do. It's not um papa, um papa, the music of Florian Gassmann. It's, it's dense. Beethoven, after the death, I mean, just to give you an idea, after the death of Mozart, was invited to play about three years, uh, no, two years after the death, at a benefit concert for Mozart's widow. He played one of Mozart's piano concertos in C minor. As, as a young man, young pianist with orchestra, he plays this to raise money for the widow of Mozart. It was a pretty close crew. And he knew the symphonies of Mozart intimately, the ones he could get scores to. Remember, this is the time when the music was not necessarily printed, but handed around in manuscript copies. So yes, his early Beethoven easily, without a doubt, is influenced by the late works of Mozart. Good question. OK, Requiem. That, was, by the way, was 1788. He was having a really hard time at that point. He, um, the, the symphony. Again, we don't know why he wrote them, but he was having a hard time. His wife was pregnant a lot. They were married for a total of nine years, and she had six pregnancies that we know of. She was exhausted, and she often had to be sent to take mineral baths in Baden. And if there's one thing you could say about Mozart that is absolutely indelible, the man was uxorious. I think the women know what that word means. He was unspeakably devoted to his wife. He adored Constanza. And when she wasn't around, he was listless. He was uh, out of sorts. He couldn't get work done. How he finished those three symphonies with her at the, in another city, he was writing, we don't know, he was writing letters constantly. And that was a very, very hard time for them. Their finances were crazy. He, he was a spendthrift. He was wasting money, he was gambling, he was borrowing. He was not the tightest ship on the water when it came to, to uh, money. Three years later, Constanza, his beloved wife, is now healthy again. It took a while. And she's pregnant again. And she takes control of the finances of the house and says, Wolfi, I've got this. You go in. She found an apartment for them. She paid off the debts with a secret loan that she paid back secretly. He never knew about it. And she righted their ship. And he had commissions coming from everywhere. He was, he was invited to write music for not only groups in Vienna, although not the big guys. He was, uh, he was commissioned uh, to write music for people in Stuttgart, in Frankfurt, in Prague and even an invitation from London to come to London with old man Haydn, who, was, who had recently been pensioned off and was invited by this entrepreneur Solomon to come to London. Solomon also had dinner with Mozart and said, boy, come with me to London. I'll give you six months there. We'll do two operas. I'll commission symphonies from you. You're going to make a, a horse load of money. And Mozart was, yeah. I've never been to London since I was seven. Let's go back there in triumph. Alas, that was never to be. In the last six months of his life, in July, he died December 5th, 1791. In July of that year, as he was going to the final rehearsals of his new opera, La Clemenza de Tito, which was in Prague, as part of the coronation celebrations of the new emperor, because Joseph II had passed away earlier in the year, his brother, Leopold, came from Italy, where he'd been living for four decades, to take the crown and become the new emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So there were celebrations all over the empire, and um, the personality of the new Leopold, the new emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, was um, curiously reminiscent of a certain American president. <laughs> Let's just say, and this is fact, he saw himself as the reincarnation of a Roman Caesar. 
And he had no room in his heart for funny opera. He didn't like comedies. He liked serious opera, specifically about Roman themes. Roman themes. Because he saw himself as an incarnation of that. Uh, lesser opera would be considered in more contemporary terms fake opera. <laughs> so Mozart was commissioned not by the, the royal house of Habsburg, but by the Bohemian estates, Czechoslovaks with money, who were on the outskirts of the empire, who wanted to make good with the new emperor and flatter him with an opera that reflected his Roman pseudo-identity. So they commissioned Mozart to write La Clemenza de Tito, the clemency of Titus, a Roman emperor who has a grand heart and forgives his enemies who would have assassinated him and other things. That's the story, uh, essentially, of, of Clemenza, La Clemenza de Tito. He finishes the opera as he's getting into the coach with his wife Constanza, 87 months pregnant, and his secretary, Sussmeyer. Um, this is true history. It's in a little bit in the movie that you know. A man shows up and says, Herr Mozart, I have a commission for you from a very wealthy man. I'm just a servant. As it turns out, that was in real history. It was not this guy's servant. It was the clerk of the wealthy man's lawyer. He really covered his tracks uh, with a, a sum of money that would have been half the price of an opera and said, here's the down payment. My master wants you to write a requiem the only condition is you would never ask who my master is. It's never to find out who's commissioning the piece. A requiem is a, is a mass, a requiem mass. Remember, Mozart wrote 17 full-on Eucharistic masses in his earlier life. A requiem mass is a special mass. It's different. It's a variation of the Eucharistic mass in that the focus is not on the worship of God per se. It's on the human being and as an intercessionary work, a petition to God, an orison to God on behalf of the recently deceased. It's a, it has a more human focus. And it's traditionally, it has a very set form within the Roman Catholic Church to which Mozart belonged. And so it was a piece, it's a work he'd never written before. He'd written devotional music, he'd written funereal music before, but not a requiem mass. He takes the commission because the money was outrageously good. And even though he was hyper busy, he went off to Prague, did the rehearsals, did the first performance, came back with a load of money, and other commissions came his way. His buddy Schickeneider said, enough with the serious Roman opera, let's write the magic flute. So Mozart, being a jovial guy, says, yes, let's have fun. We'll write this silly story with Masonic overtones and Oompa Oompa and flutes and Papagin and birds and magic dragons, yes! So he writes that and that takes up his time. His buddy Stadler needs a clarinet concerto. That gets paid for and produced. He wears himself out and does not finish, doesn't get back to the Requiem. In the movie version, there's all kinds of spooky stuff about it being, ooh, Requiem written for himself. There was a little bit of that in the actual history where he joked with his friends you know, I've never written a requiem before, and I, I, don't know if I, I don't know if I'm going to live to finish it, but it's going to be ultimately music for my own grave if I don't get this done. Ultimately, he does not finish it. He writes the first two sections, really, and sketches out the next five, and it's finished by Sussmeyer after his death on December 5th. He took ill November 20th, and he was up and down with a good day, a bad day. His limbs were swelling. It looked like he was having renal failure. Ultimately, what the doctors in that time, the, who did the autopsy uh, the day after he died, the autopsy said he had a, something called a mil, millinery or mil, okay, the millinery fever, which is a general term. Remember, this is the uh, 18th century in Vienna. People were dying every day. And so it was nothing special. They, they used this term to say, well, he died of um, failure. We don't really know what killed him, but we do know how they treated him. 
the three things they could offer Mozart in his agony were enemas, emetics, and bloodletting, exsanguination. So they treated him. The illness took its course, but the doctors did the rest. This is not unusual for that time. So he never got to finish the Requiem, it was finished later. I'll meet you at halftime, or after this, if you'd like to get to the answer of who commissioned it. We just don't have time right now because we just ran out of our time, much like Mozart did. <laughs> so, meanwhile, thank you for your kind attention, and I hope you enjoy the concert.